All right, welcome back everybody. We're gonna be working on unit one in this video, or at least beginning to work in unit one. Um, and you'll notice that since this is, I'll call this the first real unit of instruction, which is, you know, all the other units that follow basically are in the format of this one. You will notice at the very top of this uh, unit folder, when you click into it, that I have kind of a very quick listing of what the overall topics are for this unit. So our basic goals are to cover the stuff in chapter one. Uh, don't worry, I'm not doing that tonight. That's gonna be next class that we really dig into that, like actually reading through the book and covering those topics. And you know what, maybe I shouldn't say that with such definitiveness. Maybe I will cover that stuff tonight, we'll, we'll see. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk about are some really what I call essential computing concepts. Um, we kind of have this naivety these days when, when, you know, like all young people, we assume are good with computers because they have tablets in their hand when they're born, like my children were, you know, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they really know how to compute. Like they, do they really know how to manage files or operate like the, really the, the technical aspects of computer in many cases not you know what most people really do on computers is they they surf or they play a game or they social media and that's kind of it for most people right um i'm talking about much deeper level skills the ones that make you it professionals that may make you earn a large paycheck that's the kind of skills i'm talking about um so we're we're going to start with file management and and all that stuff we're also going to make sure that all of our FTP accounts are working. So we're going to use FileZilla to uh, create files, uh, not create files, to upload files. And then we're going to use Visual Studio Code to create files to upload and make sure they work. And we're going to do that all tonight, you know, within the next hour, you know, so that'll be kind of a lot of fun. Uh, so you'll be publishing your first web content in this class before you leave here tonight. And I think that's Sweet. pretty exciting. Even if it's kind of lame, whatever, <laughs> you know, it'll be very simplistic. Uh, then we're going to talk about a couple of the other things here, including some pre-tests. Uh, I don't want to scare you guys, but these are just to kind of establish an incoming skill level for what you know about web now. And then at the end of the class, we'll run the same tests and you'll see how much you've learned because it'll be a lot, I, I assure you. And then we're also going to start looking towards the end of the class because one of the end goals of this class is you will build a website project Um and you can't build anything unless you have a plan for it, right? And so you got to think about what you might build as a website. And I'll we'll talk about that assignment. We're not doing that tonight, but I, I, I want to give you the information you need to do it successfully. Now, as a typical unit of instruction, unit one has what I would call all the stuff that you'll find in every other unit folder. The first thing would be a topic list. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and click in here. And you'll see that I, I do this for every unit. Sometimes it mimics the content in the book, but sometimes I have a bunch of other stuff. So this is all the stuff I'm going to teach you in this unit. There's a lot of stuff here, right? So including, all right, well, we did the syllabus stuff already. We're going to go through all the chapter one concepts. These are the basic concepts in chapter one. Um, we are going to talk about all these things. These are all kind of related. Uh, all the essential computing concepts, computing platforms, and file management skills. And we might even talk a little bit about Zoom as we're kind of going along also, right? A lot of stuff to kind of latch on to, but all really important for moving forward. Um, as we move into the next thing, right? And you'll notice once again, um, I do have all the PowerPoints provided from the author. Now, and, I, and I, I'm gonna apologize in advance for this. In most classes I teach here at Gateway, I stay away from PowerPoints with a 10 foot pole. Right. It's like, you know, I can do the material better on my own than the, the author can do it. In this class, I use the PowerPoints to make sure that I cover every topic in that book in detail and I expand on it in detail too. So, like, we'll talk about the like, chapter one is very introductory. So, we'll talk about a lot of concepts uh, where, you know, history of the internet and stuff like that. But when we get into subsequent chapters, It'll be all coding related. It's like, hey, there, here's this new HTML tag. Let's do, let's let's code it. Okay, let's code it. <laughs> you know, or here's the CSS style. Let's try it. You know, that that's how I use the PowerPoints. So I'll use it as basically a, a, a touch point to code, right? Chapter one is an exception because it's more of a background chapter. But chapter two, in chapter two, we will learn 
most, it, you know, not all, but most of the key HTML tags in chapter two, you know, in one chapter, you know, just to give you an example. By chapter three, we will learn a lot of key CSS stuff, you know, so it get, it, it moves pretty fast in terms of con content and depth. Um, it's another reason why these class sessions are, are partially so long. Um, all right, so the, the PowerPoints are there for the taking. You can download them. You can look at them, you know, inside a bright space. It's all, that's all up to you, right? Um, I, I find that they're, they're usually pretty well put together. I usually tweak them a little bit too, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, videos, once again, will appear in this section. The new videos will appear here by tomorrow, uh, including the one I'm recording right now. Um, if you're anxious to move ahead, I have my older videos are, are present. You can see uh, from fall 2022, I have pretty extensive videos. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it, I, this is, I would say, rare occasions. Sometimes when I'm like, like doing a, a class session, I'm like, you know what? I recorded it better last time. And I just leave that one out there. You know, like if a recording like flubs or something. Uh, I don't anticipate that to be the case because I'm a professional. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, next thing that we're going to do here is I'm going to talk about these pretests, and um, as I'm moving through the content here, and this is pretty weird, um, but I'm going to have you do this process um, of going to this website and taking at least the first two quizzes, and 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 the whole point of this is, as I said before, to establish a baseline of what you know. And okay, so here's what will happen. You'll probably take the quiz and you'll get like a 20% or 30% or something like that. And then at the end of the class, you're going to take the same quiz and you're going to see your score jump from like 20, 30, 40, 50% up to like 80, 90, 100%. Because you will have learned that much stuff in the course of 14 weeks. All right. I'm going to click into it just to demonstrate how to do it. Uh, and then also to talk about this really important website this is the most important coding website um, on the internet, by the way. It's called W3 Schools. And if, in fact, I'll tell you, what, I'm going to go to their homepage first. Um, and they're built around the three primary web technologies. So they're predominantly about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Why is their material better than anybody else's? Here's the why. W3 stands for World Wide Web, by the way. And the W3 is an organization called the World Wide Web Consortium. And they're the organization, it's an international body that sets all the coding standards for the internet. They are the ones that control it. So if they're setting the standards for coding, they're the best ones to go to for how do I code this? Because it's kind of like this, it's like, they're setting the rules, so why should I get the rules from somebody else, if you see what I mean? They have a lot of really cool features, and we just do this really, really fast. So, for example, if you're learning to do HTML, they not only you know, show you some basics, but they have all these little editors in here called try-it-yourself editors, where you can go in there, and you can tweak the code and run it, and it, you can see the result immediately. So you can experiment with stuff. And here's the other little secret sauce that coders never tell anybody. There is so much coding to learn and remember that intelligent coders like myself, I, at least I like, like to think I'm intelligent, I never even bother memorizing stuff anymore. I just kind of know some stuff, granted from doing it a lot. But a, a smart coder is one that knows where to look stuff up. This is the site to go to, folks. So if I forget, I'm just going to give you an example. I forget how to do a favorites icon. Oh, man, where do I go? Oh, I just go to W3 Schools. I look it up. They give me the code. And I'm up and running. Right? Because, I mean, are you going to memorize this? I'm going to tell you what. You're not going to memorize. Don't even bother to try. What you should memorize is this website to go to to get the information you need to make it happen. I mean, let's be practical here, right? I mean, you guys will jump on YouTube real quick to figure out how to fry an egg. You can do the same thing with code. And because the web is created by people like us, web coders, there's more information about web coding on the internet than any other topic. That's the beauty of it. That's why I, this is so awesome. This website is fantastic, right? 
Now, if you look, I'm, I'm backtracking here. If you look at all the technologies they feature here. So I'm going to tell you, like in our web program, we teach HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SQL, that's databases, Python, Java, PHP. We teach all of those primary languages. And if you go beyond that, we also teach C Sharp, Bootstrap, React, <laughs> MySQL. We teach all this stuff here at Gateway. So this website, huge, hugely important great reference, great examples, book market, this will be your friend, right? This is like your dictionary, library, encyclopedia, YouTube, all rolled into one. Well, maybe not YouTube, okay. All right, so going back to that quiz. So once you get to the HTML quiz, like this one, <clears throat> uh, you will start the quiz. You will get a series of questions. I'll help you with the first one. What does HTML stand for? Well, it stands for hypertext markup language, right? And then basically what you do is you, you rifle through all the questions. There's 40 of them. You'll get a score at the end. When you get that score at the end, all you have to do to turn in your homework, you know, for this is you will screenshot this. So now if you're on a Windows PC, we have a tool built in called the snipping tool. This is present on everything from Windows 8 on up, I believe. Um, when the tool comes up on screen, it kind of looks like this. And the way that I use it is I click on you. My screen grays out. I get a little crosshairs. I click, I drag, I highlight, I release. And now I have a capture of it. And then you take this image, save it and upload it. And then I can see what your score was. You'll do this both for the HTML quiz and for the CSS quiz. If you want to do the JavaScript one too, hey, go for it. But typically, um, and and Riley, right on, Riley just put in the chat there. If you do Windows Shift S, that's a shortcut to get to that tool. I, you know, Riley, you know, I always forget to do that. I just hit the, the, the Windows key and type S and that's usually the first thing that comes up for me. So just about as fast. But if you do, uh, the Windows key shift S, it brings it up and it goes right into that mode, uh, by the way. Um, all right, so that's how you do the quizzes and, and capture your score. But the, like I said before, the general thing I see is when people start out with a pretty low score and we get that score way up. Even if you come in with a fairly high score, let's say you get like 50, 60, 80% or something like that, I guarantee your score would still go up because you will learn stuff you didn't know before, all right? All right, so we can review that stuff if you need, but that's how you get to those quizzes. I'm moving forward, folks. All right. the, the next topic here, and I'm just gonna cover this one really quickly um, because we're not gonna do this in class, but I want you to read through this really carefully. And one, like I said, one thing that we're gonna do is at the end of the class, we're gonna be building a project. And actually, as we start to do all of our sample coding, and I'm gonna be doing this starting next week, is I'm gonna start doing sample code from the book but the whole time I'm doing it, I'm building a website in the process. If you follow along with me during class and build your project while we're doing the sample coding, by the time you get to the end of the class, most of the work will already be done. Okay, so this is kind of the bonus of that. But it helps to have a vision of what you might want to build. So what I'm looking for here is for you to give me a list of three possible website projects that you might consider doing. Uh, and then for each of them, why it's a good choice, just a couple sentences. And then if you have resources that would help you build it. So for example, like if you want to build, um, you know, for example, if I wanted to build a website about guitars, cause I'm into guitars, you know, well, you know what? I got lots of guitars laying around. I can take pictures of them. Uh, I know a lot about guitars and know where to research them. You know, th those are the resources I have. You know, if you were doing a, a, a thing about like a video game, like what research do you have? Well, you have a lot, a lot of knowledge about the game or you might have, you know, every version of it or, you know, something crazy like that. I want to know what those details are. Um, then I will coach you based upon this on which one I think is the best choice. You still have the freedom to choose whatever you want. Um, but like, for example, if you were looking to do an e-commerce website in this class, not to break, burst your bubble, but that's not that's not the level of skill we're working at here yet. You gotta learn, you gotta learn to walk before you're running, right? So we're learning to walk at this point. So um, 
Will that be possible by the time you reach the end of this program? Absolutely. And then some, you know, uh, really what happens is the sky becomes the limit once you see how all the stuff fits together. All right. So that's the personal project planning. All right. The other thing that I, I'm going to put in here is um, this was put together by Wendy Revelinsky. Uh, we often both teach this class sometimes in the same semester, and she's one of our software instructors also. She put together this list. One of the more important skills that you kind of fall into when you're doing IT work is, you know what, you're working inside of Windows or the Mac OS or whatever. How do you work the operating system? Okay, that, that's part of what this is about. Um, so there's information about how to organize your files and folders. Uh, so I encourage you to read that um, and check that out. Uh, there's also this uh, tool here that tells you how to use the snipping tool. I think we just demonstrated it, but if you want more, there it is. And then also these basic computing concepts um, that just covers kind of like if you're really new to computing, um, this will be really helpful, right? There's also a little bit of information here uh, about kind of how uh, connectivity works, uh, either through Wi-Fi or through hardwire, um, just to give you a good underpinning. I, I'm not going to really lecture really heavy on this stuff, uh, but I am well versed in this stuff real deeply. So if you have deep questions about it, I'm happy to try to answer them. Right. But I just want to show you that these links are here. These are really cool links to follow, especially if you're new to the field. I would encourage you to explore all of them. All right. The next thing that we're going to fall into, and I'm going to do this before we do our playing with software and FTP accounts, is we're going to talk a little bit about file management because here's what I've discovered over the years. When I when I first learned how to get to work a computer, when Okay. And I'll just give you a demonstration of what it looked like for me, right? So like I'd fire up the computer and I get a screen like this, you know, and that was all of it, folks, right? It was just this like screen with text on it. And, you know, I would do like fancy commands like, like that to see what files I have in whatever folder I'm in, right? So if you guys aren't familiar with this, this is called the command prompt. All operating systems have a command prompt. Why? Because that's really how the operating system operates. And you know, if you're a Linux person, you know this natively because Linux, you know, even though there's graphical user interfaces, it's still largely driven around command line. Windows was completely driven by command line up until we got to the point where we had Windows XP, believe it or not. Even though Windows was sitting on top of it, it was a software overlay. It wasn't really the operating system. It was like a program on top of a command prompt. Now Windows truly is a graphical operating system, but the command prompt persists because you can do things at the prompt that you can't do in a windowed environment, often much more powerful things, right? You just have to know how to do them. But this is really weird. Like what I typed as a command on the screen just now was a directory command. And if you're at a command prompt, and you guys don't have to do this task, this is just more interesting than anything else, but I'm basically sitting inside my user folder and I, and I typed a directory command. So it, it spits out all the stuff that's inside my user folder inside of Windows. This is like how we used to do file management. Now, this is really weird, but if you didn't know how to like navigate your files and folders inside of Windows, like here I'm in the users directory, my user directory with my initials on it. In the old days, if you didn't understand where you were sitting in your file system and where you were putting stuff, you weren't computing. Then what happened is Windows came out. The Mac OS came out. We're working graphically. We manipulate files. We hit save. It goes somewhere. I'm not, it went to OneDrive or Documents folder or Google. I don't know where the heck it went, but it's in there somewhere. And then when I go back to my software, I can just search for it and search for homework and it comes up on a list and I click on it and I found it, right? And here's what I'm going to say to you. Once again, that's great for a regular computer user, a consumer. We're IT professionals. We need to operate on a much, much higher level. We need to not only know how, not only how to manage our files, but where everything is and how to navigate that system on a really much more intense level to really get to the power level of usage and the most fundamental skill for operating a computer is file management. If you don't have file management, you're gonna lose stuff. And when you're working on homework, 
or project or something you're getting paid for and you lose that file, man, you're in trouble, right? You can't lose your files. You got to know where they're at. You got to know how to manage them. So where we're going to start. So if we're working in a Windows environment, we click on the file explorer. That's what it's called. Or if you go to your start menu, you type file, right? Uh, and then it brings up this, this interface. Now, everybody's will look a little bit different. I am running Windows 11 on this machine. And the Windows 11 file manager looks a little bit different than the Windows 10 file manager, right? Um, if you have Windows 10, I'm just saying this, you could watch some of my older videos for guidance on what Windows 10 looks like um, or find other videos on the internet. But generally, when we launch into this environment, Microsoft does try to make it, let's say, user-friendly to an extent. So like one thing I do, uh, and, and for those of you that are kind of noticing this, right? Like most of you will have like a recent file list listed here in this window. Like if you go into this by default, I've disabled that because I hate it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's just a personal preference. Uh, and you can arrange your stuff any way you want. But the core of what we're doing here is knowing where the files are on the machine and where stuff goes when you save it. It's really, really important. I, mean, I can't even stress how important it is. But generally, the primary hard drive on a Windows machine is called the C drive. Why? Because with older computers, they, they started with floppy drives, and it was the A drive. And then if you got really fancy, you had two floppy drives, you had the A and the B drive. And then when they finally said, hey, let's have a hard drive that doesn't like, you don't have to like put the disk in and out, uh, we'll call that the C drive. But now that's kind of our primary drive. And then you can see, I actually have a second hard drive and then I have my Google Drive too, right? All of them accessible from this location. But the, really the core of your file system is here, right? This will show you all the drives you have connected. The C drive is the primary drive of the hard drive or the system. This is where your operating system resides in Windows. So in other words, when the computer powers up, there's some information in this chip called the BIOS chip that says, hey, Let's look for the hard drive and load the operating system. Where's, where's the operating system? Oh, it's on the C drive. Here's your C drive. And then it goes to the C drive. It finds Windows, loads up all the stuff that you need, and then Windows comes up on the screen, right? Um, and what, what is it that it's really loading? I mean, let's talk about that too. What it's actually loading is a piece of software that gives you an interface that you can interact with to allow you to manipulate other software packages and hardware resources attached to the machine. This is kind of an interesting thought, right? So the machine really doesn't do anything without a set of instructions. The instructions are really called programs, executable files. And Windows as an operating system is designed to do those tasks. So it's a collection of executable files that allows you to interact with the files on your drives and all the hardware resources, your keyboard, your mouse, your screen, your speakers, your microphone, anything that's connected, USB drives, whatever that you can connect to a computer is handled by the operating system. All right. When you start to store files on your hard drive, Microsoft and, and Apple does this too, and I think even the Linux machines do this now, is they'll usually create a folder for the user, so you'll notice that there's a user account or user folder, excuse me. And then there's kind of like the guest account. This one's called public here. Uh, and then your, whatever your user account is named, you'll have a folder. And then inside that folder is really where all your stuff is, right? Like, for example, your documents folder that you see here is actually here. Now, what's interesting if you guys have a relatively recently updated Windows 10 or Windows 11 machine, often some of your folders, including your desktop, documents folders, maybe your download folder, all of those might also be connected to your OneDrive as well. And if you guys know what I'm talking about and, and people who are savvy with Windows already understand this. So anytime I drop something into documents, on most normal Windows machines, it also ends up in my OneDrive. Now, I will tell you guys right up front, 
I'm not a fan of that. I want to control what goes in my OneDrive. I don't want Microsoft controlling it. The, the thinking is basically whenever I save something, if my, like I said before, your computer blows up, it's on your OneDrive, you can rescue it. You get a new computer, connect to your OneDrive, you pull it all back down again, all your documents are there, all your stuff is there. I'm not a fan, I like to control that, but that's that's me being more of a type A personality type where I, I know what stuff is on my drive and what I want to put in the cloud. And it's not necessarily the same stuff I put in my documents folder, right? So this is a personal choice on my part. You'll also notice I have two OneDrives here. So this one is my personal one. This one is my gateway one and they can coexist. I also run a bunch of other cloud drives, including Creative Cloud, Dropbox and Google Drive all at the same time. So I have, uh, what is it, five, yeah, five cloud drives attached to my operating system on top of my regular file storage. Now, but for most of us in general, the documents folder is where we store stuff. This is where we, you know, when we go into like a program and hit save, it's going to usually try to put it in this folder. So what I usually tell my students is, hey, if that's where the stuff usually goes, go into that folder and create yourself a folder for school, right? And if you want, and you see how I did that, I clicked the new icon up there and I'm making a new folder. And, you know, normally I would call it gateway, but I don't know if you looked up above, I have like 10 gateway folders already. So I'm going to call this like a uh, gateway, you know, I don't know, folder 22, whatever. Um, Cause I know that name's probably not taken, but you could probably just call it gateway or school or GTC or, college or living hell, whatever, <laughs> however you look at it, right? Um, and then inside that folder, what I recommend that you do, and you know what, I, you know, I'm just going to show you rather than actually go through the process, is um, I would recommend that you create folders for each one of the classes you're taking. So for example, uh, and it's possible some of you might be in my Python class on Monday night also right if and you know i might see you then um you would make a folder for your python class and then because the python class has different units of instruction you might want to make folders for all those units of instruction so you have a place to put your homework in advance of creating it so like what i'm really telling you is like it's kind of like if i build a closet and then have like a spot to put my clothes and maybe some shelves for my shoes even though I don't have the clothes or the shoes yet, but I'm ready to put them in there. It's better than having all of that and then trying to build the closet, if you, if you feel where I'm going with it. Now, as an example, in web programming, you know, like you, you can create like some folders. And what I'm really kind of looking for you guys to do in this assignment is basically do this. Create a folder for each one of your classes, but this is for web programming. And then put your unit folders inside of it and basically what this assignment about is I want to see that you've done that. So once you've done that in your file manager, once again, you can pull out your snipping tool. So I'll just do that again really quick, right? And then create a screenshot um, of the fact that you've done that. So like I, I might do it like this, right? That would work because I can see it's, you know, gateway web programming. Or if you wish, you can always... Uh, use the approach where you like tunnel into it this way. This is a little more cumbersome, but the advantage of doing it this way in the sidebar is you can see the whole hierarchy all at once and it makes a nice little screenshot right there, right? So either way, now, if you prefer, you know, if you prefer to put stuff on your OneDrive or your Dropbox or your Google Drive or whatever mechanism that you use to store your files, I want to see that you're doing it. And it's going to tell me that you're getting it done and you have a plan for storing your stuff. Uh, Monica? Yeah, I was just curious. How did you get your um, Google Drive on, um, on your Explorer? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I did mention it, but I mentioned it probably way too quickly. <laughs> um, there's a piece of software that you can download from Google. And I'm not sure, you know, and you know what, probably the best way to do it is, is just Google it, right? Google Drive software. And basically, um, 
you know, you can use Google Drive in your web browser without installing anything. My preference was to download um, this tool here, Drive for Desktop, and then it adds this icon that runs, and then it creates a G Drive. Right. So if you want to do it that way, Monica, I, yeah. I think that's a great way to do it. Okay. Got you. Thank you. So I, I think that's a great tip. And thank you for asking the question because I, I probably would have forgot to say that. But, you know, the, the bottom line with this assignment is really you have to find a way to organize your stuff. And the more organized you are, uh, the better off you are. But there's a secondary effect in, in writing web code with organizing your files. When you are doing the kind of web coding that we're gonna do in this class, which is basic static, static HTML is really what we're doing. It's all built upon file and folder structure. So the file and folder structure that you create locally on your hard drive is the same one that we're gonna move up to the website to make sure it still works correctly. And so you're gonna be doing this replication of Whatever files you create locally, you're also going to create remotely. And if you set it up right, they look identical in both spots. And the one, and we'll, we'll talk about this a lot, but the one issue that we have in both the Windows operating system and the Mac OS is they're both dumbed down a little bit for file management and they're not very particular. And then we take our files and we move them up to the cloud or up to a web server where it's hyper particular. And what worked well on our local operating system, all of a sudden in the cloud doesn't work, right? So that's why this stuff is important. But first you gotta get your Windows or Mac stuff correct. And then you can make your cloud stuff correct. All right. What I'm gonna do now is um, I am gonna, all right, welcome back from break. Uh, we're gonna now start talking about uh, the file transfer protocol, or FTP for short. Um, FTP, technically, you know, if you're really studying it as to what it is, uh, you'll notice that in its name, it includes the word protocol. And what that means, uh, a protocol in terms of technology means it's a rule set for uh, basically transmitting information over the internet. Uh, Interestingly, like whenever we're like surfing the web, and this is kind of one of those goofy things, right? Like th this URL that you see up here uh, that's highlighted right now. In essence, if you, you know, double click and see the whole thing, there's this piece of it at the beginning. And you'll notice most websites now say HTTPS, uh, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. S means secure, right? And most websites now operate in secure mode. Um, but really what HTTP is, is a way for moving information around the internet. And HTTP is the primary way for getting a web page on your screen, right? So when you request a website, it's HTTP that sends it to your computer. Now, when I decide to transfer a file though, over the internet, there's a different protocol. HTTP can do it too. But FTP is a lot more efficient at it and faster, which is why it's still heavily used, but it's a different rule set. So like in principle, we don't see it, but when we do FTP, the protocol in the address bar changes to FTP colon forward slash forward slash. Okay, so what is it really used for? It's move, used for basically uploading your files to a web server or downloading files from a web server, both. Um, and that's like, you know, kind of what we're trying to explain here. Um, and because most website creation is done locally on a local machine, and then when we want to put it on the internet, we have to upload it to a server. FTP is predominantly the tool that we use to do that, right? I will say that if you were studying uh, web stuff at any other institution or place or online course or whatever, uh, and they even touch this topic. It would usually be at the very end of a course or at the end of a course of study. So in other words, you can take entire web degrees from other places and they'll talk about like how to like 
JavaScript and PHP and dynamic websites and Node.js and all this crazy technology. And they never teach you how to actually put it on a web server. So here at Gateway, we have a very different philosophy. We want you to do it immediately. Why? Because that's really the essence of what you do as a web person. If you're not putting it on the web, you're not really creating web stuff. So why, why wait till the end to learn how to do it? We're learning it on day one, folks, because it's that important, right? You feel, you feel where I'm going with this. And this is connected because we're transferring files to file management. So why is file management important? Because if you don't know how to manage your files on your own computer, you're never going to know how to manage them on a web server. It's critical. All right. So that's the background. If you guys want, you can read the install notes here. You can read the, this cool article here about how the web works. It's actually very informative. But my goal here today, uh, before we leave here, is to basically accomplish this assignment uh, and, and check it off, at least for all the people here uh, in um, the session. All right. So the, the general goal is basically we're going to fire up the FileZilla software. I'm going to have you find your user account information uh, in the grade book. Uh, we're going to connect uh, and then we're going to create a file and then try to upload it. And after we upload the file, we're going to try to look at it in the web browser. Right. Sounds pretty simple. It'll take a little bit of time, but we will, we will get through it. So the first thing I want to do is I want to point you to the fact that in the grade book, and I'm going to have to go into learner mode on this uh, because otherwise all the passwords are exposed. If you click on grades, now I don't usually see what, this, what a student sees, but you will notice um, that there's a listing here that says Prometheus FTP username and password info. And then what you'll see here is your username, which probably is first initial last name, all lowercase letters. Then there's a space, a slash, a space, and then your password, which is your student ID number, right? So if you can retain, if you already have that student ID number memorized, great. If not, you know, write it down, have it handy uh, or have the screen up so you can refer to it. Um, but that information um, was preset. I did this, I think a day or two ago, I, I set up all the accounts um, and verified them and I have record of them. And if for any reason, any of the accounts aren't working, I have admin capability to fix it. So uh, hopefully that won't be necessary. All right, so that's the lay of the land with that. Um, so first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna fire up the FileZilla software. So if you've downloaded it and put it in a software folder like we did before, and hopefully maybe pinned it to your taskbar, uh, fantastic. If not, you're gonna have to dig in and find it. So you'll have to go to your documents folder You'll have to go to your software folder. I'm not even sure I have one here. Nope, mine's on my D drive, right? So you can organize your files any way you want. Um, there we go. And, and then somewhere in here, I got FileZilla and then there's my FileZilla program. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch this. So I'm gonna double click that. Now, once again, when you launch this, um, because this is not an installed program, you can, once it's running, you can pin it you can right click on the taskbar and pin it. Mine's already pinned, you can see, right? You will get this welcome screen. Just go ahead and say, okay. Uh, does anybody else have any different screens that come up? You have any nag screens or install screens or anything weird like that? No. <laughs> um, Rosie, can you tell me what you're seeing on the screen? Um, it keeps asking me to install new version. Oh, cancel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't worry about it, right? If it's asking you to do a new version, it, it, it's not really critical right now. Okay, okay. Right. Later, you can you can upgrade it. Okay. And I, you know, and I'll be real frank. I'm really notorious for that. It's like software's working fine. Why do I need to upgrade it? Okay. You know, that, that's that's how I think. You know, uh, generally speaking, it's for security or upgrade reasons, but uh, okay. sometimes it's not. You know. Okay. Um, all right. So once you get it up on the screen, what you're going to see is that what FileZilla is, is basically this fancy tool that allows us to log into a remote server. And then it gives us in this windowed layout here, kind of like 
six panels is what I see, right? So this is top and the bottom panel. These are kind of like status screens, right? The left side of your screen, this is a snapshot of your local computer's file system. So like if I scroll through the top part, for example, and I'll, you can move these dividers around, you'll see my desktop and this PC and, you know, my user account and it's uh, desktop and, you know, whatever, all the stuff is there, right? All my files are here. Uh, on the remote side, what you'll see is a file and folder listing for the remote server in your home account on our Prometheus server, all right? So I'm going to backtrack just a second here and I'm going to do you guys the solid because a lot of people don't know how to spell it. Right. So we've had this history here at Gateway. Whenever we spin up a new web server, I didn't start the process because, you know, you would think because I'm Greek. Right. But we always name our web servers after Greek gods or goddesses or demigods. Right. We've had a history of it. So we've had like Mercury and Kronos, Apollo, and then our latest machine is Prometheus. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to type the name Prometheus into the chat so you don't misspell it. When you type it in. So there it is. If you're curious, uh, Prometheus is the the Greek fire god, I think is the correct way to say it. Uh, and he's also the bringer of knowledge. And so the, 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 the concept is he taught men or humans how to build fire. So he brought them this knowledge and kind of spoiled mankind <laughs> forever afterwards, right? By giving them this knowledge. Um, if you go to your web browser, so I, I'm just using Google Chrome here, and you type in prometheus.gtc.edu, and once again, I'll put that in the chat for you guys, because I know sometimes people just misspell it, and there's you, you guys are getting the whole URL in there, and if you take that link and you click on it and follow it through, and it's giving me the not secure link here, so HTTP. Oh, it's still not coming up. Are you guys? Oh, you know what? Check it out. I misspelled it. <clears throat> there we are. There's Prometheus. So this is our Prometheus homepage. By the way, it doesn't go anywhere. There's no links on it. This is the page that we have just to test that it's working. So if I'm at home and I'm like, is Prometheus up? I hit the address. Oh, there it is. Do you guys recognize this graphic from anything? Nobody seen this movie? I don't know if you guys ever watched like the the alien movies, right? Alien but Prometheus movie. is one of one of the movies that is like uh, a sequel to the aliens movie. I thought it was a prequel. You know what? You're right. You're right, Rosie. It is a prequel, right? It happens before. Yeah. But this is just a, a, a screenshot of the movie with the title, and like I said, this is our test page for the server. So not a bad idea to just hit the server just as it is right now and bring it up in your browser because there's a strategy here and I'm going to show you what the strategy is in a second. All right. So if you can get that loaded, great. All right. Once you have that up in your browser, we're going to go back to FileZilla and we're going to learn how to use this product now. Now using um, your username and password they have, we're going to type first into the host box up here. So if you see this little text box I'm just about to type into, and we're going to type in that server name. However, there's no prefix to it. So you don't type HTTP or HTTPS or FTP or any of that stuff. You just type prometheus.gtc.edu. And then in the username box, you'll put in your username. I'm going to use one of my, uh, I'll call it one of my junk accounts. So I have a, an A account, which is all five A's. <laughs> And then my password, which I hope I remember here, because um, I sometimes change it and I forget what I change it to. <laughs> Pretty sad, but true. Uh, I think that's correct. Once you have your prometheus.gtc.edu, your username, all lowercase, that's important, and your password typed in, go ahead and click Quick Connect. And then hopefully you connect to something. Now you'll notice I have a bunch of stuff already in my account. You guys see that, right? You guys will see 
a connection message, hopefully. And, and, and if you get any sort of a dialogue box that comes up, because I'm going to suspect that you're going to see a box that looks like, well, I got to go back to it. Hold on a second. Hang tight. You're going to see a box that maybe looks like this. Some of you get that one? Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I got it too. I want to make sure that, make sure you click this little check box. Don't click cancel, right? So this is kind of scaring you. So like we don't run it in secure mode because let's be real frank here. We're not like sending credit card numbers or like sensitive political information or anything like that. We're just uploading silly like school stuff, right? So we don't secure our server uh, with what we call SFTP. And so they want to make sure that you know that because what, what it really means is your traffic can be intercepted in transit by a hacker that's clever possible right but what are they gonna what are they gonna steal your homework <laughs> you know good luck with that one you know like have fun yeah go ahead steal all my homework i don't care um but check that box and then click okay if you don't and you click cancel you won't be able to connect back to the server by the way right okay yeah and, and riley i didn't realize that you study cybersecurity, and yeah absolutely um now, I, I will tell you, like on a commercial sense, if you're connecting to a commercial hosting service, they will never allow insecure FTP ever because it's a, it's a hacking portal, basically, is how they see it. All right. So make sure you click that, click OK. Uh, that's why I include this here, by the way, just so just in case. Once you get past that, hopefully what happens is you'll see... Uh, the connection go through and then you'll just have an empty folder both on the top and the bottom can you guys just give me a show of hands or whatever did Got everybody it. get that to work yes yes michael oh you guys are okay you're i'm assuming that's a good with the hand raised i think mine's good okay yeah i have it connected is there, is there supposed to already be files shown on the remote site part? There shouldn't be. Okay. Um, what I don't have any, so I, I just saw there's someone. Oh, no, no, no. Was... There's not supposed to be anything there because the okay. why is because all I did is create the account, so they're just empty folders. Okay. Okay. So here's kind of the, the interesting thing about this. Like once you got your, your connected up here, here's the reality of what we're looking at. On our server called Prometheus, which sits in a in classroom 110 at the IMET campus in Sturdivant, there's a server rack in like our robotics lab, and Prometheus exists as a virtual machine on one of those servers. That's what we're connecting to, right? Um, when you're doing web work, you don't really often know where your servers are at. It could be anywhere on the planet. Interesting, right? This one we know because we actually physically touch it and manage it. Um, so that's where the server is located. But anything that we put inside the server, um, inside of your home folder, so there's a, a, a folder on the server that has your username on it. So like if your username is like John Smith or J Smith, for example, there's a folder called J Smith and you just landed in it. Anything that goes in that folder, is publicly visible on the internet. Interesting, right? Um, now, I have to be really careful here because I think that my account here, the one that I'm connected to, this is probably not the best account to connect to is my kind of my point, or maybe it is. Okay, actually, this is the one I want. But you'll notice I have an A account, a B account, a C account, and my C account is where all the examples are for our class, by the way. So we'll, we'll talk about that later too. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack here. I just wanted to make sure I was connecting to the right thing. But now that I'm actually in this account, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a file in a local file system with Visual Studio Code. Let's type some words in, into it. And Rosie, yeah, maybe hello world or whatever you wanna put in there. Uh, and then we're gonna move it over to the server and then we're going to look at it in the browser. And if we get that done, you got the assignment complete, by the way. And um, sense of power, <laughs> so to speak. All right, so let's, let's dig into creating a file now. So we're going to start first 
with file management. So I'm going to take you back to here where you were working with your files. I want you to go to your documents folder and your gateway folder and your web programming folder. And for now, the file that you can create can go right here in the root of this folder. But we have to do a couple of things before we begin, right? And, and this is slightly agonizing, but really, I, trust me, it's not that bad. All right. So the first task that we're going to do is I'm in an open spot in, inside one of these uh, folder spaces here on my local file system, and I want to create a new file, right? I want to create a plain text file is what it's going to be. And I can do this a couple of different ways. My preferred way to do it is I right click in the open area, I choose new, and then I select text document, right? That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you can go to the new interface here and choose text document, all right? So I'll, I'll just choose the second way for now. And then you can see it brings up the new interface and um, I'm just gonna let it name it whatever it is, okay? Um, the first thing that you guys are gonna notice is my file extensions are visible. In Windows 11 uh, and Windows 10, and actually the Mac OS does this too, right? The, the default for your operating system is to dumb it down and hide your file extensions. So in other words, and I'm, I'm gonna show you, um, the effect of it first, then I'll tell you how to uh, override it. But basically, for most of you, when you created that document, it's going to look like this. It's not going to have at the end of it .txt. This is highly problematic, and I'm going to show you why. Now, in order to have it render as a web page on the server, I'm going to rename the file, and I'm going to name it index.html, all lowercase, precisely that, nothing more, nothing less, nothing different. You guys catching me here, right? It cannot alter from that at all. It's in the chat, right? This is one of the rules of the web. The default name for a homepage file on the internet is exactly this, right? Because think about this. When you bring up a web page on the internet, let's say you go coca-cola.com. You're not typing coca-cola.com forward slash index.html. Index.html loads automatically. Kind of cool, right? So that's why, you know, you go to a website and you just type whatever.com and it comes up because of that, you know, basic fundamental truth. Now, here's the problem with our file system, though. If Windows is dumbing this down and hiding my real file extension, if I go to this triple dot menu if you guys by the way if you're on windows 10 um you will have a ribbon bar or you'll have uh, an a view options menu i think is where you find it but you're looking for the options panel basically which brings up this dialogue and then you want to look on the second tab under view and there's this checkbox that says hide extensions for known file types and I'm going to pause myself here for just, sorry about that, I'm back. Um, but basically what you want to do is you want to uncheck that box, right? Um, that box, and I know this is hard to read, it says hide extensions for known file types. IT professionals do not want that checked. IT professionals need to know what the file extensions are. So you want to click apply and then okay. And then notice what happens to the file. All of a sudden it has two file extensions. They got .html and .txt, which we don't want. That won't work in the web browser. Okay, all right. So if you're in Windows 11 Rio, um, you go to this triple dot menu and you choose options. If you're in Windows 10, um, you can either act, there's a ribbon bar where you can actually uncheck, hide file extension or check, uncheck it, recheck it kind of thing. Um, or there's a, um, you can press the alt key and bring up the view options menu, I think it is, or tools options, maybe it is. Right. And then once you find options, basically in the file thing, you're there. Um, but 
you bring up this panel, select that switch. And once again, I, I wish they had the ribbon bar interface that Windows 10 had because they had this like ribbon bar that would just appear and it was just a checkbox in, the, in there. And I thought that was really handy. This is problematic though. So what you want to do is once you're seeing your file extensions, you want to right click and rename that file and remove that file extension. Delete it, press enter. Windows will yell at you and say, hey, what the hell are you doing? Basically is what that box says. And then you just say, it's okay. I'm a professional. That's what you tell it, right? And you say, are you sure you want to change it? And you say, yes. Now, do you notice what happened when I changed it? How the icon changed from a piece of paper to the icon for Google Chrome, because that's my default web browser. So it's recognizing based on what the file extension is, which program should open it. And by the way, if you want, go ahead and double click it. It'll open up in your browser and it will be blank. Yeah, why is it blank? Because we didn't put anything in it. But it did open in the browser. Isn't that cool? Yes, that is cool. Go ahead and close that tab, by the way. Now our next task is to put something in that file. So what we're going to do, if you installed Visual Studio Code, you're going to want to right click that and then open with, and hopefully you have Visual Studio Code listed here. If you do, go ahead and click it. And it'll open up inside there. All right. If you don't, then go to your start menu and open Visual Studio Code and I can coach you from there. But I'm going to go ahead and do the right click and you'll notice it opens up. Right. And um, it's ready for me to type. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to type a very, very simple message. I'm just going to say, hello, world. And by the way, that's the first code you're supposed to ever write. It's not really even code. It's just words on a page. Once you've got it typed in, and now I know I'm going a little bit fast here, but once you got it typed in, go up to your file menu and choose save. All right. You want to make sure it worked. Then you go back to your file folder, right? And I'm, I'm just moving this out of the way here. Double click that index file again and notice, hey, the words appeared in the browser. You just, you know, it's not really a web page, but you put it stuff something in the browser. All right. So two big hurdles crossed there, right? So we created the file. It's loading in the browser. It's displaying the words that I typed. Now comes the fun part. Now we're going to switch over to FileZilla. Right? Um, oh, here's my, my NAG screen, Rosie, right? For installing a new version. And I'm going to just say close. I'm not going to do that right now. And I'm going to go ahead and find that spot in my file system. So I'm finding, um, well, if you put it in your documents folder, piece of cake, right? And that's where I put mine. So I clicked on documents. My folders appear here. I, oh gosh, I forget which folder I put it in, but I can look at my file manager. Documents, gateway, web programming, easy. Okay, so documents, gateway, web programming, there it is. See it, right? Now what you guys are gonna do and I'm going to have to be preemptive in deleting my previous copy here first. You guys have an empty folder here. So all you basically have to do is click on that file, drag it over to the other bottom panel and let go, and it will upload to the server. Now I'm going to pause the video for a second here. I want to see a show of hands like who got it to work and who. All right. All right. So I kind of flubbed a little bit here and I'm just, and I am recording it into the thing. Um, if you did manage to locate your index file, and 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 so um, I created it, right? If you guys remember the steps, I was able to load it in my browser and it works locally. Um, but then I have to find it in FileZilla. So I go to FileZilla, and if you put stuff in your documents folder, you just scroll to the top in this panel here, find your documents folder, find your gateway folder, find your web programming, find the file, wherever it is that you put it. And then you simply drag and drop it over to the right side. Now I already have a file there, so it's asking me to overwrite, but yours should be blank. But if you see that index file now appear on the right hand side, it is uploaded. Then the trick is just to look at it in your browser. So we're gonna go back 
to the browser where we already have Prometheus loaded, click in there once, right? Highlights the address, click again, it turns to a flashing uh, cursor, add a forward slash, a tilde, which is the sideways squiggle. It's the shift of the reverse apostrophe key, which is right above the tab key on your keyboard. And then add your username, all lowercase, usually first initial last name. And then all you have to do is press enter. If the words you typed into that document, you saved it correctly, uploaded it correctly, and visited the page correctly on the server, you are loading up the document you just created, but you're now you're loading it over the internet. This is very simplistic, I'll give you that, but you have created something on your computer and put it out on the internet, and you can share that URL with others and go, hey, look what I made. And I granted, not very fancy right now. However, the moment we start writing HTML code, which takes plain words on the page and turns it into, you know, something fancier, you know, heck, I mean, even just our Prometheus slash oh, wow. splash page, right? I mean, and all this, all this is, is an image and some text, right? And if here's another secret sauce for the web folks that you can take home with you, you can go to any web page on the internet find an open spot that's not on top of text or uh, a background image, right click and choose view page source or view source code or whatever your browser says. And you can look at the code that created it. Now, this is really kind of funny. This is me doing this, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's me being snarky, right? That's our Prometheus page. But there is code that actually creates it, which is down here at the bottom. So that Prometheus page is built with this code. This is the beauty of the web folks, right? We take really simple stuff. Basically it's text and images, you know, and some cleverness. We type it up, we put it on a web server. This is a set of instructions in the form of markup language and CSS that tells the web browser what to display and what that is, is this, right? And so you can take what is seemingly very primitive and rudimentary and turn it into something, frankly, you know, hopefully you think it's beautiful or meaningful or impactful or whatever it is, right? Um, this is just our first baby step into it, but we've already managed a really important skill here. The important skill is FTPing a file and actually putting it on the internet. And this is day one, folks, right? The next thing we learn is how to write code to make it look cool. And then we'll put that on the internet too, and we'll just keep building. You know, and th this is why I, you know, I get really excited about this stuff. Now, here's the, the next thing I'm gonna say is when you do have your thing loaded, how do you turn in this assignment? Once you have it loaded up in your web browser like this, and it's hitting Prometheus to pull it up. I want you to just simply highlight the address bar, right click and copy, and then go into the assignment and paste that link right into the submission and hit submit, right? And then when I receive it on my end, I'm gonna get that link in my grade book and I'm gonna click it. And if it loads up the page successfully, you got your points. And that's going to be kind of the basic nature of how we do our work in this class. So you'll have a web page assignment, you'll build it, you upload it, you send me the link, I check the link, right? And then I can see uh, if it worked or not, and then I can see the code. Remember, any web page on the internet, you can right click, view source, and I can see what created it. You want to get interesting on it? Heck, go go to like a, a page like Google, right click, view page source. Oh, they're trying to block me here. There we go. Right. And there's your, there's your Google page. Can you, uh, can you repeat one more time on how to send it on how you did that? You said absolutely. And, and thank you for asking. So once you get that loaded up in your browser and you're actually pulling it down from Prometheus, right? So you can see the whole URL, yep. right? Um, just highlight that, right? Right click copy, go to the uh, 
uh, assignment sub submission in, in Brightspace. Apparently, I turned that part off. So let me let me just get back in there really quick. Uh, it's still copied, and that's what in unit one. And then we go to simple FTP. And then at the bottom of that assignment, there's a box that says text submission. Like I've already submitted it and I kept it, but you just paste it in there and hit submit. Now, I'm going to give you guys another tip, though. If you come in here and you type it, I want you to watch what happens. I mean, because you could do it this way, right? You can just manually type it in. But notice it's not a link until I hit space afterwards. Pretty slick, right? You can also edit links here too if you hover. Um, they have a link editing tool, but a simple copy paste from the browser when it's working is really probably the most effective way, I think. All right, folks. Uh, I'm going to stop this recording here. That's a lot of material for one night. And um, I will be publishing this tomorrow. And then we have a lot more stuff to do next week.